because we're, we're talking here about people giving themselves for argument's sake a false idea of darwinian fitness so they they take a drug and they feel that they're doing really well right uh and when you give people these signals they're they're, they're very seductive especially if they don't have to do all the hard work to actually produce these neurochemicals in their brain by natural <laughs> processes i'm adam hunt and this is the evolving psychiatry podcast rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens Share it with the people who matter, like it if you like it, subscribe if you want to hear more. Paul St. John Smith is the founding member and current chair of the Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK. He is an editor of the Cambridge University Press volume on evolutionary psychiatry that we're talking about today. Uh, he trained in Oxford and spent some time in the pharmaceutical industry uh, before spending 35 years as a general adult psychiatrist. He has published various articles on evolutionary psychiatry, pharmacology, substance misuse, the placebo effect, and he also used to be a teacher on evidence-based medicine. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. We're talking about your chapter, chapter 12, on substance abuse and evolution, uh, which is a very interesting topic that obviously affects many people uh, and it's perhaps something that we don't really think about from an evolutionary perspective a lot of the time um so so the first question the first thing that's kind of interesting to think about is is why humans are so inclined to seek out and consume uh, to excess often uh, these these non-nutritional psychoactive substances uh, obviously from an evolutionary perspective you know why do we evolve to have this this kind of vulnerability well, the evolutionary perspective is quite complicated. I mean, it's much simpler to explain why people do individual things uh, on an individual basis. So uh, in the here and now, or as we call it, the proximate explanation is, is often that people use it um, uh, for a range of reasons. One is to uh, get rid of pain, psychological or physical pain, or to induce pleasure, or as part of some sort of ritual or to be social because it's something in in our culture um so a lot of people start drugs that way um and of course starting drugs tends to be voluntary mm. but the continuation of taking drugs at some point becomes involuntary and that's when we say people are addicted or dependent or whatever and there isn't really an evolutionary explanation for individual cases as such evolution is about populations um and although it actually helps us understand what's happening in individuals there isn't an evolutionary explanation for one particular case as such so your question says why why does it occur in evolution well there are various types of theory there are adaptationist theories to say that at some stage there's an adaptation which encourages let's say drug taking or permits it uh, and from which there is a trade-off some sort of advantage and there are others that just say it's a byproduct of something else that is an actual advantage so it may be um, something which you know if you take it it gives an advantage in certain circumstances and I think we, we see this with drugs, don't we? That drugs can be advantageous in certain circumstances. And by, by drugs, I mean therapeutic drugs as well. And um, we'll come on to that at a later stage. Um, but humans have found that these plant-based chemicals, and let's face it, they largely are plant-based, although some are animal-based. Yeah, um, the old toad. These plant-based chemicals have had effects on their central nervous system. And I think it's important to realise that human beings, as well as other uh, higher animals, actually seek out substances, um, not always knowing the long term consequences, of course. Um, and so creatures, organisms, humans, hominids, primates, whatever, can actually take these drugs and to a greater or lesser extent, learn what they do and go back to them and of mm. course the uh, more developed the central nervous system the more likely individuals are to have a, a, an understanding of the cause and effect of 
what they've just consumed from a from a plant and go back to it and consume it again if it had an uh, an appropriate effect now of course most plants uh, are, are satisfying because they're nutritional or not as the case may be but these have a special effect of course, humans, uh, and in fact, hominids, so there's evidence from ancient history that Neanderthals used drugs, and there's evidence from uh, other forms of biology that uh, vertebrates, and in particular other primates, uh, use a whole range of substances when they find them uh, for various pharmacological purposes. And putting two and two together, uh, humans have taken them over millennia. And of course, with the advent of uh, the Neolithic and farming, certain drugs like alcohol could be cultivated and produced in large quantities, which has a, uh, a separate um, but additive or cumulative effect, because instead of just finding something in the wild which has an effect uh, in small amounts, you can find large quantities or you can produce large quantities. And uh, that in itself, uh, I, th I think it was Stalin said, quantity has a quality of all of its own right so yes the reason uh, people start taking drugs as individual but why the species takes drugs is because uh, homo sapiens recognize that certain plants and as i've said before uh it's generally plant-based substances that uh, uh have these chemicals in them and of course that 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 begs the question of why do plants have these chemicals in them which uh Right, that's exactly what I was. Going to be your second question. That's exactly what I was going to come on to. Um, yeah, so in actually in the other, uh, to to divert slightly, um, in in my interview with Robin Dunbar, he points out that the uh, the effect of alcohol has this kind of very very powerful social um, effect, but uh, but perhaps we weren't able to consume large amounts of uh, highly uh, very strong alcohol. Um, and, and similar things can happen with with all drugs, obviously. Um, but but yes, the this yeah, well, is if the... you want to talk about the the sort of social aspect, that 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 is very very important. And Robin's chapter is very much worth reading, and it comes at it from a a social and psychosocial perspective. And it isn't a glorifying alcohol use in the sense that it is uh, a good thing, irrespective, but that it has particular effects. Mm. And which have been valuable to humans. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we are all quite quite aware of those effects in our daily life, and also how what their excesses can uh, can can lead to uh, to less valuable and, and harmful effects. Um, but but this is an interesting part of your chapter, which perhaps people wouldn't think about going into it, um, which you just touched on. Uh, why is it that plants would be? Would, why would they have evolved? Mostly plants, of course, as you said. Um, why would they have evolved? To have these substances which have these very specific um psychological effects you know it's 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 weird that these well, things are out plants there haven't evolved sorry plants haven't evolved to have alcohol in them necessarily right it's that's that's a per process of fermentation and that's to do with yeasts uh as distinct from the plants or fruits often themselves um fruits meaning grapes or apples you know wine or cider um, but of course grain is fermented into beer uh, and that may have been an accident or of course there are some theories that say beer came before bread yes um we mentioned that with we, robin actually we won't yeah. go into that uh, there's a lot of theories around and um and there's a lot of books on it now which are very interesting including a very good book by uh, robin dunbar as you mentioned and also a chap by uh, a book by a chap called uh, slingerland um which is very readable uh a very good name for somebody to write on alcohol slingerland i would think <laughs> yes, anyway <nice. laughs> onto, but things like nicotine um uh you know other other substances which are sort of out there salvia denorum i believe you mentioned um well, yes i mean i mentioned a whole load of chemicals i mean nicotine is particularly interesting um because although tobacco is the western preference for um taking nicotine or perhaps nowadays vaping is the uh, yeah. majority but yeah. uh, um it, it, over historical times nicotine's very interesting because it's um very good at uh, getting rid of parasites from animals' gut. Now, of course, 
that gives you a clue. Um, you, you take nicotine and you have florid diarrhea if you eat nicotine you have florid diarrhea uh, if you take enough and uh, you uh, expel the parasites or that that's the theory and i know mm. certain nicotine containing plants are used for this process in various aboriginal and uh, Mm. Uh, older cultures and, and of course it's not an accident that near nicotinoids are used as insecticides mm. and they're they're related um but nicotine is in plants to protect the plant now this is a paradox of course why do we why have plants got chemicals in them that are supposed to protect them which humans take well it's a matter of scale if you're an insect and there's as a been alluding to there's there's a lot of evidence that these chemicals in the plants prevent uh, insect and indeed uh, slightly larger creatures herbivores from consuming them because it makes them so sick mm. by interfering with their gut and with their central nervous system uh, and in their gut there's the sort of peripheral nervous system so these are powerful neurochemicals which um, have evolved basically I, I mean evolution involves a lot of chance it must have been that certain plants have had a mutation somewhere in in their you know chemical synthesis apparatus and produced a chemical which gave them an advantage mm -hmm. and so and... that the ones with those chemicals were not consumed regularly animals stayed clear of them insects stayed clear of them now of course humans come along and there's several things they can do is they can work out something about dosing they take a little bit and they can also work out things like it had an effect on my mood making me feel brighter or less miserable or taking mm. away pain or giving me a feeling of energy or, or something like that and they can optimize doses they can think about how much to take in a, in a very crude way, of course, and also use it for its direct effect on parasites. I mean, there are parasite theories of drug use, which may be an adaptive theory to say that those humans that use these chemicals had an advantage, not just because of the social, which we alluded to earlier, but because it actually made them fitter by getting rid of parasites now of course smoking 60 cigarettes a day in the western world doesn't get rid of parasites it probably predisposes you hugely to lung cancer and cardiac disease and so on and so forth mm. uh, but in the ancient communities when lifespan was perhaps 30 or 40 years that was much more unlikely so you get the social effects you get the anti-parasitic effects and and i was going to mention there are a whole range as well as um, the social models. There's a whole range of models as to why um, evolution helps us understand a little bit about the species predisposition to substance use and abuse, but not necessarily the addiction process itself. Mm. Okay. Uh, I think that's more complicated and I don't go into that and perhaps leave it at this point. Um, yeah. Um, but there are, I, and I, I, the, the chapter, the, the whole point about the chapter is to explore these models. Yes, you, you mentioned. I, I've got a little list here of them. There's generic mismatch. We talked about the Neolithic production of excess. There's the hijack model that's closely related. And of course, there's the problem of completely novel psychiatric or psychi psychoactive substances that are now produced, which mm. bear no resemblance to plant chemicals, but act on the same transmitters and systems and then there are various models we mentioned pharmacophagy and neurotoxin regulation regulating the amounts but um going to closer to the uh, robin dunbar and slingerland models there's things on uh, sexual selection and signaling life history based models and models based on the sociality and the importance of uh, sort of uh, cultural evolution and getting together in groups and it's not an accident that we toast <laughs> weddings and baptisms and things like this you know there's a long tradition of use of alcohol and in fact in some generations and some cultures people didn't trust people that didn't drink right and still some today so, i mean i think the irish are pretty <laughs> Uh, strong on enforcing a, a drinking culture. Also, I've well, heard from my the, Irish friends. There are lots of um, 
there are lots of stories of you know banquets where an individual stayed sober and then promptly murdered all his extremely drunken colleagues uh, or you know other forms of intoxication so the the distrust of the sober person you know what are they up to um but that that's not the reason why individuals start taking alcohol or other uh, other drugs and of course other drugs have different things to alcohol that alcohol is the probably the cheapest generic easiest to get certainly in the western world but there are things like cannabis cocaine and heroin which have markedly different pharmacological profiles um, which people know and in fact the, the cannabinoids have a range of different profiles they're not one thing there are a whole range of different chemicals some of which are actually antagonistic to the effects of straightforward cannabinoids so mm. there's agonists antagonists and so on and so forth so it is a very complicated thing, which I don't try and explain every single variant in the chapter. But we look at each of the models and try and make some sense and explain the deeper history of alcohol use as a species as and as cultures. But of course, cultures diverge with some using alcohol, some using cannabis, some using whatever. Um, and so there isn't a one size fits all once you get into um, human societies post the uh, uh, leaving Africa, I suppose, out of Africa. Um, and the, the deeper evolutionary theories are based sort of pre uh, leaving Africa. And mm. they, they are based on the sort of phylogenetic and what happens to other primates. And then, of course, where you start with Robin Dunbar is the the the, the function of alcohol in his chapter mm. in societies which become more complex. So so we have this picture of yeah, humanity evolving alongside these plants with these psychoactive effects. And definitely there's something strange going on in the modern world because we have, you know, all new drugs appearing and huge quantities of extremely strong drugs. And that probably caused a lot of the, the problems that we have. But, you know, when you take the evolutionary perspective, you can see that perhaps there wasn't as much harm back then. And, you know, some people might wonder why we hadn't, haven't evolved to be very aversive to drugs, seeing as how harmful they are. But clearly, you know, many of the very strong harms that we see are probably quite novel. Um, so how do you think, well, you've treated many patients with, um, with uh, drug and alcohol problems, I know. Uh, and what do you think an evolutionary perspective lends uh, to understanding drug use and abuse? Um, and how do you think it should affect our thinking kind of both at the public health level um, in, in terms of clinical responses and also just kind of how we, how we think about how society should, should act? Um, and think uh, concerning these these substances well this is very very complicated and will take a lot of thought um certainly i think as scientists we all recognize that understanding root causes can be very helpful just understanding the sort of end game causes uh clearly isn't working uh, there are still major problems with alcohol nicotine um and of course cocaine heroin and uh, and cannabis and other drugs um, one of the main things is to understand the social aspect there isn't just a pharmacological solution that the, the pharmacology alone is not enough to explain it otherwise you could just have as we do have heroin blockade you know you can block opiate receptors end of and why doesn't that stop all opiate addiction mm -hmm. and that's a socratic question and of course, you have your own thoughts as to why people use heroin and blocking it isn't going to stop them using it. In fact, if you use um, uh, opiate blockade on addicts, they, be, they go into withdrawal and are very, uh, very unhappy with the person who's administered the blocker. And of course, that happens with uh, opiate overdoses. You, you try and reverse the opiate overdose. And the person wakes up and is very angry and, you know, feeling absolutely terrible. So you're not thanked for reversing it, uh, even though that their life was under threat, you know. And right. so it's not a simple pharmacological solution. So we have to look at the psychosocial. And this goes back to models like, you know, um, why did people start taking it in the first place? And what are, what are the incentives to continue? And there are the psychosocial incentives which don't involve dependence. And then there is, of course, the, the problem of dependence. Once the brain has um, 
become dependent on these chemicals. It's no longer a psychosocial reason why they're used, or, although they, those remain important as well. And so uh, the evolutionary approach looks at what can be put in place of uh, the use of the, such drugs in social in social life and it is quite difficult because you know a, a glass of wine or a beer you know lots of people are happy to do that and take that in a social gathering either at a family event or you know after work with friends or um, whatever um, and I mean other things fulfill these functions to a degree so sort of various hobbies people do can give them uh, great enjoyment you know people exercise and get the opiate rush and people do music uh, mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of things you know I mean uh, music for instance being far less harmful than taking heroin <laughs> well usually mm. <laughs> there might yeah, be exceptions the music. Um, yes. but, <laughs> there might be and of course you, one can use heroin therapeutically you know or or, or let's say morphine because heroin is a novel psychiatric substance because it's chemically altered so um you know these things are not all good or all bad they you know they 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 can take over people's lives and they can be bad um but they're not automatically only bad because for instance the plants which were only bad for human beings are not addictive people don't take right. um laurel leaves containing cyanide for addictive purposes do they <laughs> I mean, they don't purposefully kill themselves. So there must be other effects going on, which we go into in the chapter. And really, the chapter is an early chapter in trying to understand this, because it not only is psychiatry very complicated, but substance misuse is very complicated. And we try and look at all the different ideas that are coming through and the evidence for them. And I suspect, I suspect there's going to be numerous reasons which are interactive. We always, as scientists, try and look for one cause and one effect. Uh, my feeling is there's likely to be many causes, many different things interacting in unpredictable ways, uh, and that, you know, different drugs have different phylogenetic histories and different reasons for being taken and have different risks. And the therapeutic answer to them will be different. So, for instance, uh, people that are lonely taking drugs to fill that gap, mm. the argument would be approximate argument to help them with their socialization. But of course, if they have a psychological block against socializing, you have yet another task on top of the socializing. You can't just shove people in groups and tell them, here you are, you're now socialized. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So, uh, but there is also for public policy, and I think public policy um, works on the the mismatch hypothesis to some degree and the availability of excessive amounts. So you reduce the amounts, um, but that hasn't worked very well, of course, because people find ways of storing stuff and finding illicit sources and mm. so on and so forth. Or in alcohol's case, in the times of prohibition, they just make their own. Right. Yeah. I mean, the war on drugs has, uh, you know, famously failed. Drugs won is, I think, the the quip line. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever whatever way forward we have, we have to kind of maybe recognize this long history and then perhaps also, yeah, see the, the sides where it's not harmful and the sides where it is harmful and try and find a, a middle way. Um, but obviously that's quite difficult to put into to policy and to yeah to think about there's but... something very profound isn't there about you saying about drugs of one to that extent there's something very important there to ponder why have they won why why has making things illegal and having you know billions spent trying to enforce you know either prohibition or uh you know removal of drugs from the um circulation why does this keep failing and, and that's what we have to ask. And looking at the evolutionary causes gives us a deeper reason for reflection about what's going on and, and the ways of tackling it and what things can be substituted. Because we're, we're talking here about people giving themselves, for argument's sake, a false idea of Darwinian fitness. So they, they take a drug and they feel that they're doing really well. 
or if, if it's a painkiller or something less bad right uh and when you give people these signals they're, they're they're very seductive especially if they don't have to do all the hard work to actually produce these neurochemicals in their brain by natural <laughs> processes you know yeah. you, you get a quick high you get a a, a a quick reward but understanding how to produce a society where people get the natural rewards, rewards which are sustainable is probably the way forward um both at an educational school level and for rehabilitation processes mm, that's really interesting yeah that's that's a great a great thought to end on um let's let's hope that you know the evolutionary perspective is recognized more and more and that we do kind of start um, being a bit more nuanced in, in uh, how we think about these things and how we tackle them so thank you thank you for this paul it's been wonderful You're welcome thank you cheers adam